I want to talk to you tonight very briefly for a couple of hours on a subject really burning in my heart. When I came to Bloemfontein 19 years ago, God spoke to me very clearly and God told me, build for generations to come. Just coming back from Israel with uh, Francois and Elmerie and many of our pastors, I realized what generational building is. Sometimes God tells us things and we don't actually understand what God is saying to us. There I saw that the people in Israel years ago would build the synagogue for the next generation. And sadly today in many places people are caught in Christianity just for the moment. Many people live just for the moment. They sell out for the moment. And they don't plan to live for the future and for the tomorrow. So tonight I want to talk to you about another generation. I believe the greatest generation is alive on planet earth right now. How many of you believe that tonight? Come on. And that's you tonight. Amen. All the young people under the age of 85. I said all the young people under the age of 85. You are the greatest generation. You are what God is doing. But I want to talk about our tomorrow. The generation that will follow this generation. Psalm 145 verse 4 the Bible says, One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. One generation shall declare your works to another and shall praise your mighty acts. And then Judges chapter 2 a message scripture for tonight, verse 6 to 12. The Bible says, When Joshua dismissed the people, the children of Israel went each to his own inheritance to possess the land. So the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua. Everybody say all the days of Joshua. I said everybody. And all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen the great works of the Lord which had been done for Israel. Now Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died when he was 110 years old. And they buried him within the borders of his inheritance of Timnah Heres in the mountains of Ephraim on the north side of Mount Gaash. And when all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them, who number one did not know the Lord, nor the work which he had done for Israel. Another generation arose who did not know the Lord, neither did they know the works of God. Therefore the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. And they forsook the Lord of their fathers who brought them out of the land of Egypt. And they followed their gods from among the gods of the people who were all around them. And they bowed down to them and they provoked the Lord to anger. My message tonight, another generation arose. Our text, verse 10, when all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord, neither the works of God. Maybe one of the most amazing passages of Scripture in the Bible, talking about three generations Yeah, A generation, Moses' generation, who God delivered out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand, who saw ten signs in the nation of Egypt when God brought them out, saw the miracles of God, the pillar of fire, the pillar of cloud every day. But that was a generation that never inherited the promised land. An unbelieving generation. A generation that when they woke up in the morning, they saw God, they saw the fire of God, they saw the power of God. But they never ever knew God. Then there was the Joshua generation. The generation that crossed over into the Jordan River. Or over the Jordan River into the promised land. And the Bible says this generation served God. They knew God. They knew the works of God. They were the ones that saw the miracles of God. They inherited the promised land. But after them, amazingly, the third generation arose. Who did not know God. Neither the works of God. What went wrong? A generation that heard about deliverance from Egypt. A generation who saw the power of God. Who saw Joshua perform mighty acts for God. Who saw Joshua pray and the sun stand still. But after Joshua died and all the leaders of that generation died. The Bible says another generation arose who did not know God. This must be one of the most tragic scriptures in the Bible. But not only in the Bible, when you study church history, you will see a generation that serves God. And very often the generation that inherits that platform does not serve God. Very often those who never sacrificed, somehow when the inheritance lands in their hands, they do not take it further. I believe that that is changing in the church today. I believe that God is raising up a millennial generation that will serve God, that will take the glory of God to the ends of the earth. Come on, if you believe that tonight, say amen. They're in Pretoria as well. 
I believe God is raising up the greatest musicians in the house of God today. The greatest preachers in the house of God today. The greatest churches are still to be built by the next generation. The greatest businessmen are still to be raised up. So if this generation did so much, think what the next generation should go do for God. Because the Bible says from glory to glory. Think what those should do that take the baton from us. The 13-year-olds now, the 20-year-olds now, the 25-year-olds now. What exploits will they do for God 20 years from now and 25 years from now? What are the greater works that you will do for God? In Daniel 11, 32, the Bible says, But the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. When you read the Bible, as far back as Genesis chapter 5, you will see the Bible talks about people who lived and died without ever leaving their mark upon their world. The Bible calls them sons and daughters, a nameless generation. But then the Bible says in Genesis chapter 5, there was an Enoch, a man who walked with God. What distinguished him? He was a man who walked with God. There's something different about people that walk with God. There's something different about people who have God encounters on a regular time. There's something different about people who know God, not who hear about God. Not those who just see the acts of God and the works of God and the miracles of God, but those who know God, the generation that knows God. The Joshua generation were people who knew God. The generation who followed him never knew God. In Genesis, you will see children that were born and died. There was an Enoch who walked with God. Then for many generations, the Bible doesn't highlight any individual. Then in Genesis chapter 6, the Bible says, but Noah was a just man, perfect in his generation. Noah walked with God. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. Three vital signs that will cause a generation to do great exploits for God. What is needed in every generation? Because this generation sitting in this church tonight, all these thousands of young people across our country, you have to lead people that are not even born yet. Do you understand that? I mean, your children's children. When I came to Bloomington, God said to me, build a church for your children's children's children. I'm only beginning to understand now. He said, build a church for your children's children's children. For your achter klein kinders. Nou, as jy jonkers kan jy nie so ver dink nie. Want as jy jonkers, dan dink jy net tot morgen. Of jy dink tot die einde van die jaar. Of jy wil borde in die bediening ingang. En jy besef nie dat God de God van generaties is nie. That God, God calls his church generationally. That this move of CRC is meant to go to the nations of the world. And as Jesus said in John chapter 14 verse 12, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do. Because I go to the Father. So there are greater works that God has for you. Amen. Greater businesses that have to be built. Come on young businessmen, say amen here tonight. Greater works that has to be done. Greater messages that have to be preached. Greater places that have to be uh, uh, conquered for God. Another generation arose. I want to talk about that generation tonight. The generation of tomorrow. The generation that God is looking for. The church that God is looking for. Three keys for every generation to emerge to greatness. Number one, every generation must have their revelation of God. God doesn't have grandchildren. Neither does God have orphans. You cannot serve God on your parents' faith. You cannot serve God on Joshua's revelation. You need your own revelation of God. You need your own encounter with God. You need your own defining moments with God. You need to see God for yourself. Are you listening to me tonight? You can be excited about what's happening in CRC and miss God. You can be excited about the buildings we are building and never encounter God in the midst of all of this. How is it that in a revival people backslide? In a revival, people disconnect from God. When you study church history, you will see the waves of God and the moves of God and God building something great and then a generation comes that do not take it further. Why? Because it's easy to ride on somebody else's faith. It's easy to rest on your laurels. It's easy to just sit while the next generation or the previous generation is laboring. But there comes a time for every generation. And I'm talking to a generation here tonight, sitting in South Africa. There comes a time where every generation needs a revelation of God Almighty. There comes a time where every generation needs an encounter from God. Needs to hear the voice of God like the sons of Issachar. What is God saying to our generation? The Bible says the sons of Issachar had understanding of the times. They knew what Israel had to do. I believe that God reveals himself in a very special way to every generation. That's why the church has to be adaptable. 
That's why we have to change our worship, change our praise, change our methods all the time so every generation can have a fresh encounter with God. What was the problems in the days gone by? The generation of today tried to put their revelation on the generation of tomorrow. The generation of today very often would not lead the generation of tomorrow to the mountaintop, the place of sacrifice. And hear me clearly, my dear young friend. I can lead you to the mountaintop, but I cannot keep you on the mountaintop. I can call you to the place of prayer, but I cannot bring you to the place of sacrifice. You have to hunger for God for yourself. You have to seek God for yourself. There was Moses, great man of God, comes down the mountain, his face shone. And not one in his own generation served God. As a matter of fact, even his brother Aaron, when Moses delayed his coming down from the mountain, the Bible says they made a golden calf. Aaron returned to a former distorted image of God. Moses was the only one in his entire generation that served God. Wow. A whole generation delivered. But then there was a generation that followed. An entire generation, as I believe is in the church today. A new generation, a young generation, a generation in love with God that is emerging. Come on, that will do the greater works of Christ that will change communities. Come on, give the Lord a praise because I'm preaching to you tonight. Hallelujah. A generation who are not in it for their own glory. But they understand their glory is the glory of God. Their cause is the cause of Christ. That they're alive to impact their world. That they're alive to make a difference in their world. They're not here just to live for themselves as previous generations. But they're here to be different. And I'm here to announce to you tonight, you will be different. I'm here to tell you tonight, you are different. I'm here to tell you tonight, there's something very special about you tonight. I'm here to tell you that God has predestined you for this hour. I'm here to tell you tonight, many of you are in the birthing canal. You are about to be birthed. You are about to be released in Jesus' name into the greater things that God has for you. Hallelujah. That's why you're experiencing this uncomfortableness, this pain, this awkwardness. You don't know where to walk, where you fit in. Because you're going through a birthing process. God is busy with you. You're in the press. God is busy releasing something in you. God is busy raising up a new generation as he did in the early 80s and late 70s. There's any drug hang. God is busy with you. God is busy not just with individuals. God is busy with an entire generation. He is preparing a new generation. Oh, come on. I want to jump on some of you and shout to some of you and tell you tonight that the best days of your life are ahead of you. That you will be great and you will do great things for God in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. But you have to seek Him for yourself. You have to hunger for God for yourself. You cannot stand at your tent door and watch Moses have a great time in the presence of God. You cannot watch Jesus on the mountaintop communing with his father on the Mount of Transfiguration. You have to go there yourself and be transformed. You have to go there yourself and be changed. You have to go there until you have the mark of God upon your life. Until you change for eternity. We're not talking about salvation. We're talking about a generation that is being birthed by the presence of God. Jeremiah 29, 11, the Bible says, I know the thoughts I think toward you. Says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. You will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. There are certain things you will only get from God. Listen to me. Your gift and your talent will take you this far. There are certain things you're going to get at the altar of prayer. Mm. The call of God, the purpose of God. God says, I know the things I have for you, the thoughts I think toward you, the future I have planned for you. But this will happen as you seek God with other people, but by yourself, as you press in closer to Him. Well, everybody is worshiping, you worship. When everybody leaves, you stay. Because you're hungry for God. Anybody hungry here tonight? Come on, lift your hand and shout hallelujah. Come on, give Him a praise offering. Hallelujah. Jeremiah 33 verse 3, the Bible says, Call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. 
There are things we have to do, places we have to go that we don't know yet. God will reveal them to us as we press into Him. Some of you are going this way. You're going to have a Damascus experience. God is going to take you that way. You're going to discover who Jesus is. You're going to discover the plan of God for your life, and you'll never be the same again. I said you will never be the same again when you discover who God is, when you discover who Jesus is. When I came to Christ, I learned to pray at the foot of my bed every day. I would go and kneel, not religiously, but I would go and kneel at my bed every night and I would pray. I would pray to God because there was something burning in my heart. I would say, God, use me. I would rather die. If I can't do, if I can't go for you, I don't even want to live. So much was the passion of God burning in my heart. And one night as I was praying at the foot of my bed, it was like hot liquid fire that fell upon me. And that fire went into my belly and I've been changed ever since. I got fire in my bones, not because I got it from a theological school. I got fire because I was touched by the burning bush. I was touched by the God, the consuming fire. Come on, I was touched by God himself who burned out my old nature and burned in something new in my heart. I was praying in the church when the call of God came to me. I was praying at the altar when God called me to Bloemfontein. I was praying when God spoke to me sovereignly. God anointed me for this work. There are certain things you will get only from God. All your strategizing will not get you there. All your bluff will not get you there. Your strut will not get you there. The only thing that will get you there is discovering God for yourself. He's having the mark of Jesus upon your life. Other people seeing the mark of Jesus upon your life. You having your God encounter. And this is what defined Joshua. When Moses went into the mountain, the Bible says there was a young man. I love what the Bible says, a young man. But we know Joshua was 40 years old. Amen. Any 40-year-old here tonight? Hallelujah. But Joshua stayed in the presence of God. When Moses came down, the Bible says in verse 11 of, of, of Exodus chapter 33, the Bible says, So the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend, and he would return to the camp. But his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. Joshua knew God. He did not only go with Moses to the tabernacle of meeting, he stayed until he had a God encounter. I want to tell you tonight, my dear friend, when you have a God encounter, you will never be the same again. You cannot be the same. You cannot go back where you were. You cannot be dead no more. You cannot be blind no more. When you are touched by Jesus Christ, you are changed forever. You are a man on an assignment or a girl on an assignment. You have a mission from God because you were touched and changed by the glory of God. Come on, somebody give God praise in the house. Hallelujah. There are some things you will only get at the altar of prayer. There are some things you will lose when you no longer are at, are at the altar of prayer. These early prayer meetings we have is to bring the next generation to the mountain. God said to me, just like Abram took Isaac to the mountaintop, take this son of promise to the mountaintop. Take this generation to the mountaintop. Take them and learn. Teach them to sacrifice. Teach them to be a living sacrifice. Because while many people think vision is all about me, vision is all about him. Joseph had to discover when he had his dream and he told his brothers, he thought it was a dream of greatness for himself. It was a dream of rulership. Later on when he went through the press, through the mill, and he stood in the place of God. He realized that this dream, yes, was a dream of greatness. But it was a dream not of rulership, but a dream of servanthood. He had to learn that he was on this earth to serve the purpose of God. Like David, who served his generation by the will of God. That God will make you a businessman to serve the purpose of God. You will be a top musician to serve the purpose of God. A top sports person to serve the purpose of God. And you will only discover your purpose on the mountaintop in the presence of God. When you put yourself on the altar. Well, let me rather say, when you allow, because no one can put himself on the altar, correction. When you allow this generation to put you on the altar of sacrifice. I've never seen an animal go to the altar. Somebody has to take him, her, to the altar of sacrifice and put them on the altar of sacrifice which is the place of servanthood and call down the fire of God so that this generation will carry the flame and the fire of God so that everything a 
about us is burned away. I'm not talking about Christianity where you grovel around on the ground. I'm talking about Christianity of purpose, where a generation, because it's one of the lies of Satan today, keeping a generation away from the house of God, telling a young generation you don't need leadership, telling a young generation you don't need to be in the house of God, telling people you don't need to be under spiritual authority. Well, one generation shall talk to another generation. One generation will lead the next generation. We have to take the next generation to the altar. We have to take the next generation to the mountaintop. We have to take the next generation to the place of sacrifice. Come on, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. So the first thing that you need, the first revelation you need, is a revelation of God. Yahweh, who is God. Because when you see him for who he is, he becomes the voice. I saw how many people serve God and fall by the wayside. I've seen how many great dreams and visions aborted. I've seen how many great people with the call of God upon them not in this race any longer. Because they stopped coming to the altar. They moved away from the place of sacrifice. You watch in the Old Testament under the Old Covenant, whenever people had an encounter with God, what did they do? They sacrificed. They gave back to God. We're not talking about sacrifice that, that, that gets you to heaven, but we're talking about sacrifice of worship, sacrifice of appreciation, giving back to God. Coming to church on a Sunday to sacrifice, to give to the one who changed your life forever. When a generation no longer goes to have a fresh encounter with God, they will camp in yesterday's valley. They will eat yesterday's manna and become stale and settle. And then all that matters is me, myself, and I. So even this generation, the 60-year-olds, the 48-year-olds, the 50-year-olds, the 90-year-olds, you need to get to the altar. And you need to have an encounter with God so God can show you what He's about to do in the earth. The Bible says in Amos 3 verse 7, The Lord God does nothing unless He first reveals it to His servants, the prophets. God will show this generation what He's planned for the next generation. And we need to be a selfless generation to help people to get into their destiny. We have to lead them into their destiny. And the only place I know how to do it is to get you in the presence of God, where the fire of God will fall upon you, where God will deal with your issues, where God will deal with your pride, and God will deal with your pain, and God will deal with your insecurity. There's no other place than having a face-to-face -face encounter with God. Staying at the altar until He touches you. Who are you, Lord? What is it that you want from my life? I discovered my purpose as an 18-year-old at the foot of my bed. The more I prayed and the more I came to church, the more I began to discern the plan of God for my life. Brings me to point number two. This generation needs a revelation of the house of God. Listen to me. A revelation of God's house, the local church. A revelation of and a love for the house of God. A lot of people think you can serve God outside the house. No. No. The house of God is the place of revelation. The house of God is the place of His presence. The house of God is the place where He gathers His people together and He illuminates them to His purpose in the earth. In Genesis 28, a great scripture, the Bible says, verse 10, Now Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran and came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it on his head. Imagine having a, a, a stone for your pillow. You're not going to complain again that the pillow is too hard, amen? How about a stone? We did that in the army. But at least we put a sleeping bag over. Right, Clive? It says, and he stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones in that place, put it on his head, and he laid down in that place to sleep. And then he dreamed. And behold, a ladder was set up on the earth. And it stopped reached to heaven. And there were angels of God... And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Get the picture. Jacob is sleeping. God is standing at, the, standing at the top of the ladder and he sees angels going up and down. Now what are angels? 
ministering spirits, the Bible says. Hebrews 1 verse 14 says, they are ministering spirits sent forth to minister for the ears of salvation. They are there to help you fulfill your destiny, to build your business, to expand God's kingdom. Verse 13, and behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abram, your father, the God of Isaac, the land of which in, in, on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and the east, to the north and the south, and in you and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you. Hallelujah. Isn't it amazing how God always says, I'm with you. I'm not against you. It doesn't matter who's against you. It matters that God is for you and God is on your side. Just position yourself. Be in the place where God has called you to be. The house of God. He says, I will keep you wherever you go and I will bring you back to this land and I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. Then Jacob awoke from the sleep and said, surely, surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. And he was afraid and he said, how awesome is this place. Hallelujah. Listen now. This is none other than the house of God. Hallelujah. How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. Come on. If you love the house of God, give Jesus praise for the house of God. And he doesn't stop there. He says, and this is the gate of heaven. Wow. The house of God, the gate of heaven. Why? Because it's the dwelling place of God in the earth. When we disconnect from the house of God, we disconnect from the gate of heaven. When we disconnect from the house of God, we disconnect from revelation knowledge what God is doing in the earth. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Then Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he put his head on and set it up as a pillar and he poured oil on top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. Bethel, which means the house of God. But the name of the city had been Luz previously. Luz, Luz meant gathering place. Watch how God brought him to a gathering place. And then God calls it the house of God. Amen. I thank God for the house of God tonight. I got saved in the house of God. On the 14th of November, 1982, I got saved in the house of God. I got baptized in the Holy Spirit in the house of God. I received my vision in the house of God. While I was sitting listening to anointed men of God preaching, I received direction for my life and the plan of God became clearer for my life. That's why I returned to the house of God. Because the house of God is where I encounter God. I love church. Since the day I got saved, I love church. It's my highlight on a Sunday, not because I'm the pastor. If I don't go to church on a Sunday, it's as if something is missing in my life. Just walking in here on a Sunday just lifts my spirit because I can sense God is in the house. God is in the place. Come on. Hallelujah. And Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me, and keep me in this way that I am going, and give me bread to eat, and clothing to put on, so that I come back to my father's house in peace. Then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set up as a pillar shall be the house of God. So he built a memorial. He built one stone. Now, today we build many stones. I mean, we are living stones, but we build many stones. We build the house of God, the church. We know that the building is not the house of God, but the building houses the house of God. So when you come here on a Sunday, go to your gathering place in Cape Town, go to that tent in Pretoria, go to that theater in Johannesburg, go to different places in South Africa and in Botswana and wherever you are tonight, you can say, I'm going to the house of God. I'm going to the place of revelation because when the Bible is open, when the word of God is preached, there's a spirit of revelation. And, and, and it's impossible not to get something from God if you come with a hungry heart to the house of God. That's why we return every Sunday. Because it is the place of God. It is the awesome place of God. Amen. Amen. I said, it is the awesome place of God. He said, how awesome is this place? I stand here and I, and I get wowed myself when I listen to the musicians. When I listen to myself preaching, I get wowed myself. I think that, that was good. Because I get revelation as well in the house of God while I'm preaching. How awesome is this place? Much better than sitting in front of TV, TV tonight. The house of God. We need a revelation of the house of God. 
Because there's a lot of voices trying to pull young people out of the house of God. How you can just flow together in gatherings, but you don't need to be part of the house of God. Jacob says, I will return to the house of God. I learned as an 18-year-old the value of the house of God. I came to church every Sunday. That's what saved my soul. That's what kept me strong in the move of God. Coming to church every Sunday. When the doors were open, I would be there. I would be there first, and I would leave last in the house of God. Little building. But I understood God gave me a love for the house of God. If you want to be a great generation, you need a love for the house of God. You need to appreciate the house of God. You need to pray for the house of God. You need to build the house of God. You need to be build memorials in the house of God. And you need to bring your tithe to the house of God. I thought I was going to get a bigger shout for that last point. I learned in the army to bring my tithe. Because the tithe can they kept me connected to the house of God. I was 18 year old and I brought my money to the house of God. I was in the army earning 118 rand and I brought my 20 rand as my tithe every single month to the house of God. It was the greatest honor for me to bring my money to the house of God. I thank God I taught my children since the day they were born that the tithe is holy. You bring it to the house of God. Not because I'm the pastor, but because this is the house of God. And if this generation will do greater exploits, you need to have a love for God's house. And you need to serve God with your money. You need to bring your tithes to the house of God. You need to bring your offerings to the house of God. Come on, somebody shout amen in Jesus' name. So Jacob says in verse 22, And this stone which I have set up as a pillar shall be the house of God. And of all that you give me, I shall surely give you tenth back to you. Of all. 400 years before the law. <laughs> oh, your heart changes in the house of God. Your life changes. You get the dream of your future. You get your wife in the house of God. I met my wife in the house of God. You get your children are born in the house of God. You dedicate your children to the house of God. One day you will be buried in the house of God. It's all about the house of God. How awesome is this place? If it says, because I seek my affection on your house, I will bring off my own wealth. When you love the house of God, you don't have a problem with giving. We need this generation to be the biggest givers. If we're going to build the biggest buildings. We don't need a shouting generation. We need a building generation. I said to Francois, who's been in this church now for almost 20 years with me as the pastor here, I said, he's been with me through every building project. Every building project. When we, were that, when we built that little building, one and a half thousand seater, he was one of the 200 who gave sacrificially so that you people can sit in these seats tonight. Those years I used to preach over here. The platform was here somewhere. And I would preach. This was the church. That was, this was it. And the first Sunday we came in here, it was like 200 people. We had just car no carpets, no chairs, no nothing. People like that. Sacrificed for the generations that were to come. Because that's what a sacrifice is. A sacrifice is for the benefit of other people. For us to change this nation, this generation must learn what it is to sacrifice. You bring your prayer. To the house of God. You bring your talent to the house of God. You bring your tithe to the house of God. When you get your first job. You bring your first fruit offering. When you get employed as a doctor. When you get employed as a teacher. When you get employed as an architect. Whatever it is. When you get that first paycheck. It should be the biggest honor for you. Like a Jacob to say. I will bring a tithe of all that you give me, God, to the house of God. Because the house of God is what changed my life. Oh, come on. Give him praise in the house for the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. Come on, Pretoria. I want to hear you all the way from Bloemfontein. Give him a praise offering for the house of God. Amen. I love when we have prayer meetings and I see people bring their children. Angelique was baptized when she was two years old in the Holy Ghost. Two years old in the house of God. We raised our children in the house of God. 
Not Narita had a baby and the next minute she wasn't in church. She had the baby on the Tuesday and Sunday she was leading praise and worship and brought Angelique. Six weeks later she had to go back to work and Angelique grew up like a parrot on my shoulder as a young pastor in Lady Brain. Every morning as I was praying, three hours every morning, after five o'clock to eight o'clock, I would start praying again at about nine o'clock to eleven o'clock and she would be in my office, six weeks old. And I would walk around with her on my shoulder like this and pray to God and declare things and believe God. I mean, in those years in Lady Brand, I had a vision to build a building 20 meters by 20 meters. I used to say, God, if I can only build a building of 20 meters by 20 meters. Now, this platform is bigger than 20 by 20. But that was my vision. I just wanted to build a 20 meter by 20 meter building. And I thought if I have a building this big, oh God, I, I, will, I will be the happiest man on planet Earth. But God never allows us to settle if we seek Him. And then we build a building in, Pretor uh, in, in, in Lady Bran. That's a little building of 15 meters by 30 meters or 25 meters by, 30 me by 15 meters. Can see 300 people. And in that beautiful new building we're building in Pretoria, the chapel are exactly those dimensions. Why, you ask? So I can remember where I came from. So I can remember the faithfulness of God. How I had to pray and believe God for that first building of 15 meters by 25 meters. That was my vision. And I used to pray and say, oh God, if we can just build a building like this. And the first Sunday, 90 people showed up. And I used to pray and say, God, if you will just fill this building, I will be the happiest person on planet Earth. And God filled the building. And we went to a second building. Because people were always willing to sacrifice. This generation, my generation, were always willing to sacrifice and to give generously into the offerings. And I want to salute that generation and thank God for that generation that have brought the work of God this far. Come on, younger generation. Give God praise for those that have gone before you. Because you stand on the sacrifices of those that have gone before you. Those who built when you were not even born. Those who prayed when you were not even alive. A generation who understood. People say, why do we build such a big building in Pretoria? Because we're not building for ourselves. We're not building a wall around the 12,000 people that we are in Pretoria. We're building for tens and tens and tens of thousands of young people that we don't even know. People that still must be born. People that must be saved. People that will still have a God encounter. People that will walk in on our sacrifices. Because there's a generation willing to pay the price. Oh, come on. Somebody in Jesus' name. A generation that loves the house of God. A generation passionate about the house of God. I was glad when they said, let us go to the house of God. I was glad. Because my spirit gets lifted in the house of God. I get lifted when I see people saved. I get lifted when I hear people praise. I get lifted when I hear the word preached. I get lifted by the spirit of God. The house of God. Loving the house of God. Having a revelation of the house of God. Stairway to heaven. God standing at the top. And when you come as a generation to the house of God, and you seek God with other generations in the house of God, revelation will flow. And you will become who God calls you to be. Bethel, the house of God. How many people are sitting outside of the house of God? Bitter, offended. They disconnected from what God is doing in the earth today. I'm not asking you, are you going to heaven? I think we're beyond that now. I'm asking you, are you part of this move of God, of glory in the earth? Not you with your little candle and your two friends that look like you. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about the church of Jesus. Something awesome. Wow, something beautiful, something impressive, the church. If you look at the Temple Mount, we were just in Jerusalem. I mean, my jaw almost dropped to my toes, if it's possible, to see how they built this ginormous place. Stones that weigh 150 tons. And we talk about the challenge of putting on 
the steel structure, the roof trusses in Pretoria that weigh each one about 20 tons, as if that is an engineer feat. And in those years, without technology, they moved stones. And they built something perfect. 150 tons. Nothing skew straight. And I imagine Jesus going there. Started in a small place, Nazareth, but never ended there. He went to the Temple Mount, he went to Jerusalem, and he ascended those stairs. And he preached there. And had the vision, not just for Jerusalem and Israel, but for the world. And the Spirit of God fell on those steps in Jerusalem and empowered believers to have a vision for the world. And he said, upon your sons and your daughters, I will pour out my Spirit. He chose that gathering place at the Temple Mount, which today is symbolic of the church, the universal church, represented by the local church, where he pours out his spirit, and he gives people these dreams, huge dreams. I mean, when I was 16 years old, bound by alcohol and man, man, marijuana and other stuff in my life, I never thought I could do something big for God. I wanted to be a lawyer, and you know, and that's fantastic. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. But I never thought God could use me. Never even thought about it. But the more I came to church, the more I listened to preachers, the more I saw God just use as ordinary people. I began to get a dream in my own heart. Use me, God. And he used me. In the church and through the church. I've stayed in the same church since the day I've been born. Never jumped. I'm not saying if God plants you here, it's a bad thing, but I'm saying if God plants you here, then stay. Stay for the duration. Love the house of God, even when things happen that you don't understand. When this youth revival started in our ministry, many of the old generation left. They said, We can't handle this. I mean, a man walked to me one day, I'm talking about years ago, 10 years ago, and he said to me, Pastor, see you track young men on. I said, we moeten on track. I had my suit on, my tie on, and I had the Heer nie nie. They're serving God. Now, we're not saying wear these low and behold dresses. It's not what we're saying when you come to church. Amen. But what we are saying is, this is the house of God, where we come to worship Him. And when you worship Him, you will find your wife. But when you look for your wife, you will find the wrong person. But when you worship God, a year later, the lady standing next to you, maybe your eyes open and you see this is my wife. In the house of God. In the house of God. In the house of God. A young generation married to the house of God. A young generation in love with the house of God. A young generation committed to the house of God. A young generation financing the house of God. It's not a place you visit. It's a place you live. Your life flows from the house of God. The revelation of God's house. Satan will always do the opposite to what God does. Tries to dismantle. Get people to have an encounter with God and then they gather together, three of them, and they sing their little praise songs and that's their little experience with Jesus. And I say little because that's exactly what it is. The only people who benefit by it are those three that sing their little praise songs together. My light, your light, prophesy to me, I prophesy to you. All that charismatic nonsense. People that don't want to be under authority. Yes, under authority. You need to be planted in the house under, 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 under. Onder geestelike gesag. No matter how talented you are. You can have ten doctorates. You still have to be under authority. Spiritual authority Vested in human beings. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. It's never going to change. 
you're never going to get the church out of the equation of what God is doing in the earth. Because Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. I'm coming back for a church without spot and wrinkle. You treat the church with disrespect, you will treat your own life with disrespect. You take care of the house of God, God will take care of your house. This generation. The Gen Xs and the boom has got us this far. The millennials and who's the next generation, Aretha? Why? Why? The net. The net them generation. Net. Netty generation. We date on Facebook. Amen. We talk on Twitter. Send the same Facebook message to 10 girls. And the one who takes the bait, she's the date. Jullie moet nou maar leer, jong dames, elke jong man het een plan. Hij kan niet staan, halleluja, halleluja, die broer het een plan. Je moet niet laten jou alleen kry nie. Want dan begeet hy, is gesalf en geseen. Kan hier maar nie lig. Kan hier maar saam met ander mense. Ek het hoeveel wonderlijke jongmans geseen wat geroep is dier die heren, wat die vrou dier mekaar meer raak of een meisie trou, wat nie een passie vir die heren het nie, en daar verloor hy ou sy passie vir God. En hy verloor sy passie vir die huis van die heren. Luister vir my mooi. As jy jou passie vir God sy huis verloor, dan is dit die einde. Ek wil dit vir jou baie duidelik stel. Daar is christene wat oorhal by die huis van God sit. En ek kritiseer hulle nie. Maar as mense wat hulle eie leven lei, en alles omtrend christenskap is, niks is omtrend jou nie. Het gaan alles oor God en ander mense. Amen. Come on, give God praise for the house of God. Come on, really, out of your heart tonight, give God for the pray for the give God praise for the house of God. Come on, come on, all over the country, let's thank God for the generations that have gone before us. Let's thank God for the sacrifice of those that have gone before us. Come on, come on, let's give God praise for the house of God. We give you praise, Father, for the generations that have gone before us, Father. We give you praise for the faithfulness of those that have gone before us. We pray, oh God, give us a love for the house of God. Give us a love for your church, oh God. Use us to build your church, oh God. Let us be a generation that will plunder hell and populate heaven, we pray, oh God. Use us, oh God, through your church, we pray in Jesus' name. You said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. We worship you, Jesus. We say, how awesome is your place. How awesome is your dwelling place. How awesome is your church. We thank you for your church. We thank you for your body in the earth today, Father. A house of glory. A house of splendor. We worship and we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. For a house of revelation. As we come, we hear God. We get inspired. We get instructed in the house of God. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. 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 We worship you, Jesus. We worship you. Why is it so light in this place? We worship you. It's not glory, it's the lights. We worship you. We worship you. We worship you. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you. Esa kabando la shata kabrese. Oh, drasanda la vase ambanda sa tarabando so turba. Kibrese kere biando lo vase ke kam kam bingo da sa tarabande. Kiando la vasa tariando lo bashanda. Ebrahando sahai yemakana mazando lo bosho. Come on, let your heart just ri ri reach out to heaven tonight. Let your heart just reach out to Him tonight in this place. Come on. The church is the gateway to heaven. It's the place of revelation. It's the place where you will hear the voice of God. It's a place where God will revive dead dreams. It's where God will revive your strength. Where your vision will be restored. Come on. The gateway of heaven. The house of God. We worship you, Father. We worship you for what you have done. We praise you for what you're about to do in the earth, O oh God. We praise you. The greater things are yet to come. Greater things are still to be done. We give you praise. 
We give you praise. We give you praise. Jesus, come on. I can take you to the mountain, but I cannot pray for you. I can bring you to the altar, but I cannot sacrifice on your behalf. Come on. Is there a Joshua in this place tonight? Is there a young man or a young girl that is hungry for God tonight? Is there a generation that will go where other people are not willing to go? Is there a broken heart in this place? In Pretoria? Some of you, your spirit is in a, your belly is like in a knot as the fire of God is stirring in your belly tonight. There will be a great birthing in these days that lie ahead. Many, 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 many. Let your heart reach out to him. Let your heart reach out to him. Forget your friends. Forget your dignity. God brought you to that place to set you ablaze. Standing in that tent in Victoria, God brought you to that place to set you ablaze in Jesus' name. Oh, Rabahanda Yanakana Zendeliando Lagasha, Arakata Karabazata Labandosha, Abragato Kora Kandala Dadera, Iataiyaraha Zatara Bando, Iabahanda Lazando Lajandeke, Iakayana Kanto Kora Bandalaba, Ibrebe Setiriando Labashara, Aratalaba Katorianda Laba, Regabato Ratana, Iaraba Sataya Mahola, Iandalaba Santarianda Ragatala, Oh, Raise up your church, oh God. Raise up your church. Pour out your spirit, I pray, upon our sons and our daughters. Breathe your life upon us, Jesus. Oh, Nasanda Yamala. Oh, I fan the flames of revival. I fan the flames of fire in the name of Jesus. A great and a mighty generation, a great and a mighty army of God emerging through our land, emerging in our nation in the name of Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit, breathe your life on us, I pray, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you. Giver of life, bread of life, we worship you. We lift you high above every name in this place. Jesus. 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 Jesus, <laughs> 
Some of you are thinking too much about yourself, thinking too much about other people. You're standing in the presence of God. The only place where you will change permanently. The only place of permanent exchange where He will take your weakness and give you strength. Where He will take your fear and give you faith. Where He will take your sickness and give you healing. is your presence, oh God. How awesome. How awesome. How awesome is your presence. As the deer pants for water, so my soul yearns for you. As the dry and a thirsty land, so my Spirit yearns for you. Come. Bypass the reason and the intellect. 